I've just come ashore on a very remote section of the North Australian coast. Let's just assume that I've broken down, or the boat's broken down. I'm shipwrecked, if you like, and I have to survive on this coast for some time. Now, how would you cope in a situation like this? Well, basically, you need shelter, you need water, you need fire, and you need food. Now, what we need first is water. We can't survive very long without it. So let's have a look in the boat and see what we've got so we can start collecting water. And if there's no surface water, we're going to make it. Now, in the boat, we've got all sorts of pieces of plastic. I've got quite a number of plastic bags. We've also got large sheets of plastic that I use to keep all my gear dry. We can take these plastic bags and the sheets of plastic up into the sand dunes and we can start making water. On the hot, arid dunes, there's no surface water. After scraping out a large hole, Malcolm fills it with freshly cut mangrove branches. In the middle of the hole, he places a billy and covers the lot with plastic sheeting. Any kind of plastic of any size can be used and it's held in place with sand. Once I've got all that plastic completely sealed, the last thing is to place a rock right in the middle of the plastic over the billy. So that is now the last point. So with the condensation forming, it'll run down and drip into that billy. It's now extremely hot. I feel like I'm in an oven. And these mangroves that we put in here this morning are now virtually cooked. There's still a lot of water running into that billy. Just about to check it for the first time. Wow, dear, it's hot in here. It's like a sauna. Well, this is truly remarkable. I've now filled up the, the cup and there's still, oh, a litre or more in that billy. All you have to do is throw out these leaves, put another fresh lot in, cover it over, keep doing that every day till you're rescued. Plastic bags are tied over leafy branches and the condensation soon begins trickling to the bottom of each bag. Clear plastic gives the best results. It's quite incredible the amount of water that you can collect like this over two or three days. And in a survival situation, this water would be the difference between life and death. Good water too. Now that I've got a reasonable supply of water in the plastic bags, the next step is to make some fire. The easiest way, providing you've got one, and I always carry one, is a good magnifying glass. Under this 40 degree sun, it's going to take me about 20 seconds to get a good fire. Well, there we are. Fire in 20 seconds. 
If you ever go out in the bush, make sure you always take a good magnifying glass. There are a number of other ways of making fire besides using the magnifying glass. I've picked up a few bits and pieces here and I'm going to try another method. Most of us know how you can get a long straight stick and place it in a hole in another piece of wood and twist it around like this. Now I can do that, but it is very difficult and it is best when you have two people. So as you go up and down, you can alternate because your hands get very tired. There is another way. I've already cut a hole in the wood and now it's just a matter of cutting a groove where the hot embers will flow out. Everything's ready. I've got my hole, I've got my bark to catch the embers, fine dry grass. Now the next stage is to make up a bow. Green wood and I've tied a piece of nylon fishing line across here. One, two twists and that is the secret of the exercise. Place it in the hole. I've made up a holder here out of an old can. If you didn't have any tins or cans, you could use a piece of wood with a hole in it. Righto. Here we go. This method is about 20 times easier than attempting to do it with your hands. Now this is a critical part, to get the glowing embers to ignite. <laughs> there we are. Well, it's very hard work, but it gives me a lot of satisfaction to know that I can always light a fire out here in the bush. In a survival situation, some type of basic spear is vitally important. It's just a matter of finding a reasonably straight sapling, taking the bark off and straightening it in the fire, and of course, last of all, putting a point on it. Straighten my spear. I'm using the technique that the Aboriginal people have used for thousands of years, and that is to heat the sap in the wood while it's still green, and with care you can take the, all the bends out of the wood. Very warm. Straighten it just to the point where your wood's starting to creak. And you have to continue doing this right along the spear until it's perfectly straight. I don't recommend this method unless you've got very good teeth. 
but when the wood is hot, I can get hold of it a lot better. Mm, a little bit of a crack here, got to watch it. Once I've got a good point on it, I will harden it up in the fire. Now, if you were stuck without a knife, just remember you can use a stone or you can use shell, like the Aboriginal people did. I've got a nice point on that. Now, just harden it up in the fire. And on the next low tide, I'm going out on the reef to see what I can catch. On the reef at low tide, there's an abundance of food. Seaweed, crustaceans, mollusks, and fish. With his spear straightened, dried, and hardened, Malcolm uses a technique learned from the Aborigines as he prods the deeper holes for rock cod. sea breeze ripples the surface. Squeezing the oily insides from a bechtemere or sea cucumber, Malcolm spreads the intestines over the water and the oil smooths the surface to give perfect visibility. spear is used to flush fish from under the coral ledges. As he moves along the water's edge, Malcolm spots a number of edible shellfish. freedom of the open reef, he clambers into the dark, tangled, claustrophobic mangrove jungle. The mangrove would have to be about the most difficult place to find the feed. You've got to put up with these incredible roots and the mud and the sand flies. But the rewards are worth it because you've got the beautiful big mud crabs and you've got a delicious shellfish. And if you prepare to look around the roots at low tide and crush around like I've been for the last hour, you can get yourself a really good feed just a matter of putting them on the hot coals for a few minutes and you've got a good meal. But well, it's just about time for me to go back to the camp, I think.
The shellfish and mud crabs need only a light roasting on the glowing embers. On one of his long walks on the reef, Malcolm discovers a remarkable natural phenomenon. Waterfalls that appear with each falling tide. A dramatic spectacle stretching almost to the horizon. On the high reef, Malcolm finds a large baler shell reproducing. The gelatinous egg mass looks delicate, but it's tough and quickly hardens. It will be left attached to the reef while the young mollusks develop. When they hatch, they are perfectly formed miniatures of the adult. Bailers, common on many northern beaches, were often used by the Aborigines as food and water carriers. And as their name implies, they were useful for bailing out canoes. Clams too are plentiful, and like the balers, can be eaten if no other food is available. In the areas of the reef covered with water even at low tide, Malcolm seeks out holes in the coral that have been excavated by jawfish. Dropping a baited hook down the hole guarantees a feed every time. Just out from the mangroves is a classic example of survival, an old Aboriginal fish trap. On certain tides, the stones, piled high, trapped whole schools of fish. Even now, as it falls into disrepair, fish are marooned at low tide, and Malcolm soon picks up a meal. when these stone traps were maintained by the tribal Aborigines, hundreds of fish were regularly rounded up on each falling tide. The midday meal is always cooked on the open fire. And now Malcolm heads out to the nearby coastal islands. In many places along the coast of North Australia, the Aboriginal people knew of plants that they can use on the reef at low tide to poison fish. Many years ago, an old Barty Aboriginal showed me this particular plant 
They don't use the top of it, they use the root. Just break that off. This is the root that I can use when I gather enough of them. I need more than one, I need a whole bag full. I'll pound them up with a rock, take them out on the reef at low tide and catch myself a good feed of fish. Before I use these roots to poison the fish, I have to strip off the bark, which is a fairly tedious and slow job. Mix it with sand and pound it up so the sap from the bark mixes with the sand. I'll bag all this up and take it out on the reef. As the tide drops, fish are often trapped on the reef and seek shelter until the following high tide. The drug mixed with sand quickly disperses and within minutes the fish begin to behave erratically, some jumping right out of the water. The drug affects the nervous system and the fish die quickly. This would have to be the best way I know of getting a feed. Even without a hook or a line, half an hour on the reef, I've got 20 fish. Here we are. In a survival situation, these eggs would keep you alive for a long time. On many of the islands in North Australia, at certain times of the year, you have large colonies of nesting birds. And at night, you can catch the birds, you can eat the flesh raw, you can even drink the blood. And of course, you can eat the eggs. I'll just put this egg back because I must stress that in a normal situation, you don't touch the eggs and you certainly don't touch the birds because they're protected. There's usually food available along the rocky shoreline, although it's often difficult to collect. Oysters are a rich food but it's tedious work breaking them open one by one. Malcolm uses an old Aboriginal technique to collect a large quantity of oysters easily. Spin effects from the rocky ridges is fired. The dry resinous grass blazes fiercely 
and the shells open. It's now a simple task to collect a handful of food. Ah, it's a tough life. Fresh oysters by the dozen. An ability to identify animal tracks is vital for survival. On many of the beaches, you will find these tracks. A lot of people panic when they see these tracks because they think they're crocodile tracks. Well, they're not croc tracks, they're turtle tracks. And in a survival situation, these tracks will always lead you to food. At night, a female turtle has come up here and laid her egg. Now, most people would automatically start digging in this depression. We can dig here for hours and you'd never find the egg. She's laid the egg somewhere behind me. The whole area must be systematically prodded to detect loose sand. It takes skill to determine where the turtle has deposited her eggs. Patience is needed to remove the free-flowing dry sand. Now, turtles are protected. So I must stress that you wouldn't normally take their eggs except in a survival situation. If you were stuck on an island or on the mainland and you did find some turtle eggs, they would keep you alive for many days. You can eat these eggs raw, or you can boil them in salt water. Now, I don't think anyone will mind if I demonstrate how soft the shell is on one egg and how easily you can get out the moisture. You've got the white, and inside you've got the yolk. And you can eat these just like this. That's pretty rugged tucker, but it will keep you alive for many days. Half a dozen of those eggs and you're right. You've got to remember too that there, are, there are around about 60 eggs in that hole. The eggs must be covered again with sand to keep them cool and fresh. In a lot of these little jungle thickets behind the sand dunes, you can find food, bush fruits and yams. Now, this dried yam has grown up this aerial root. I know it's a yam because I've been shown many times this particular leaf by the Aboriginal people. Now, I have to follow it down where it's curled around and find where it's entered the ground. Very late in the dry season now, these vines are breaking off. You've got to be very careful to locate the spot where it goes into the leaf mould. It's quite a job digging these yams out. Not so bad now because I'm down past all the roots from the trees. Just about at the bottom of it. I don't want to break it off. Uh, here we are. 
You're wondering what it tastes like. It's just slightly sweeter than our normal potato. Yams, rich in carbohydrate, have always been a basic food for the Aborigines. Good tucker, this. The native fig tree. Common on all the rocky outcrops. Little sweet fig. Very nice. The discovery of a pliable vine prompts Malcolm to make a crab trap. Right now I'm making up this trap, just using these long vines, just a dish shaped trap. I've never used this vine for mud crabs. When I was a, a boy living up in the Pacific Islands, I used to make a lot of traps for fish. This is something that anyone can do when you're out in the bush, if you can find the right sort of material, just twisting them around. It's fairly primitive, but I'm pretty sure that it's going to work very well. In the on the side here, I'm making a pocket. So I'll put my bait up in the pocket so when the mud crabs go in there, I'll stay in there hopefully when I lift it up. Crab and fish traps can be made in any shape or size depending on the ingenuity of the maker. Secured for several hours in the mangroves, the bait of dead fish has attracted some good-sized crabs. Once again, Malcolm ventures into the dank, gloomy mangrove thickets. Now let's assume that I'm stuck on the coast. I've lost my boat but I have to travel. I'm stuck in the mangroves. There's an old trick that I learned from the Aboriginal people many years ago. They make a raft from this particular mangrove tree, and I'm going to make one of these rafts now. Now, I have the luxury of a little tomahawk. In the early days, the Aboriginal people would cut themselves a piece of hard mangrove wood with a stone axe, and they would use the hardwood to cut the roots of the softwood. Using the hardwood was very slow, so I'm going to go back to the tomahawk. Look what I found, some more tucker, mangrove worms. If you're really hungry, you can eat these. Mmm, nice. I'll tell you what, the biggest trouble with the mangroves is the sand flies, and they're starting to get into me now. When the sand flies get really bad, there's only one thing to stop them, and that is to coat yourself 
All over with mud. Forget about what the mud looks like. No one's going to see you out here. Or what it feels like. It's rather cool, actually. But it certainly keeps those sand flies off. It might also be very good for the complexion. <laughs> Malcolm toils for several hours in the oppressive atmosphere, cutting 17 poles before the incoming tide surges through the trees. It's a hard slog, out of the gloom, back to the open, sandy beach. With the poles rapidly drying on the hot sand, the tedious job of building the raft begins. Once I've got all these nice and pointed and tapered, I can put them all together. They are rearranged until Malcolm is satisfied that they fit neatly. The hardwood nails to be used will be whittled from this acacia that grows high amongst the rocks. I need 68 of these nails to hold the raft together. Only these long nails hold the poles together. No bindings or glue is used. When the wood is seasoned, it's extremely buoyant, like balsa. The mangrove wood is very soft. It's still very hard to get these nails in. The raft is made in two sections and left to dry. These mangrove rafts have always intrigued me because the Aboriginal people on this coast used these rafts for thousands of years. They travel with the currents, hunting turtle, hunting fish, and hunting dugong. They don't make these rafts anymore. They use aluminium dinghies and outboard motors. And this could well be the last mangrove raft that'll ever be made on this coast. Now it's just a matter of tying it together and I'm going to go out and see if I can catch myself a feed of fish.
there were only a few seafaring Aboriginal tribes that ever made these unique rafts. To use a raft efficiently, the hunter must have good local knowledge of the tidal currents. The Aborigines covered hundreds of kilometres along the northwest coast. It doesn't take Malcolm Long to hook a nice trevally, and he heads quickly for shore before any sharks are attracted. Late in the afternoon, Malcolm heads off, enjoying the new experience to try his luck again. Malcolm hooks one of the nicest eating fish of all, a bluebone. in the bush or in a survival situation I believe there's always one way that fish should be cooked now what I need is lots of hot coals and really hot sand so first of all I get a really big fire going now I don't scale these fish and I don't gut them I don't even worry about the sand on them because I'm going to cook them in the hot sand. The idea of this is to retain all the moisture in the flesh. And if I gutted them and scaled them, they would dry out. The scales are like an aluminium foil. We put them on the hot sand and cover them over. At this stage, they don't look very appetizing. So what I do is carefully peel away the sand and the ash and the skin. And underneath, you've got beautiful, sweet, juicy meat. By cooking it in the coal, it retains all the moisture. That is the best tucker you can find out here. Mm. Practicing these survival techniques has been great, but now it's time for me to move on. I've just been asked to go to Wyndham to catch a giant rogue crocodile, and that is really going to be an adventure. <laughs> 